Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 7. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope to the excuse me, called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If your house is like mine, you have many, many things that have warning labels on them, right? You can start in my garage with my lawnmower that has a warning label to tell me how to avoid getting hurt. You can go to the, the cabinet where we keep our prescriptions and have all that fine print that's on those. You can go to the bathroom and pull out the hair dryer where it tells you not to use it in the, in the shower while taking a shower. You've got all sorts of warning labels in your house. And for the most part, we ignore them, don't we? For the most part, we're totally indifferent about them. And if we do give any thought to them, we make fun about how silly they are at times. And at times they are. But I want us to think about warning labels today as being helpful. I want us to think about them as a way to, to avoid that which is unpleasant, if we can avoid that. If you're a manufacturer, if you produce a product of some sort... This whole thing of of warning labels on your product, it falls under the category of product liability. And from what I've read, apparently there's two principles that would guide a a company in, in deciding whether or not they needed to put a warning label on their product, and if so, what kind of wording that they would use. The, the first principle is that companies must take care, take care not to put customers in unforeseen danger. If I'm producing something, and I know this is how I want you to use it, but I have a feeling that maybe some folks may not do that exactly, and because they don't really understand the danger, they're going to, we got to warn you, okay? The second principle is this idea that companies have to provide sufficient warning for foreseeable danger. Now that's where, that's the one that where you get into all the really silly kind of warning labels, right? But even at that, warning labels are meant to be helpful. Q-tips or those kind of products will typically have a warning label on it telling you not to use an ear canal. Now that sounds rather obvious, doesn't it? I got thinking about that as I was preparing this, so I went to the, into the bathroom and pulled out the box of the, of the swabs that, that we use, and I looked around, and sure enough, there was a warning label, do not use in the ear canal. But do you know what else it said? It also said, told me that this product was for the outer ear only. Don't put it in, in deep. The company saw this unforeseen danger and tried to warn people like you and me. Where it gets silly is where people do something really stupid that was not foreseeable, even by the companies that made it, and then probably tried to file a lawsuit against the company and all sorts of bad things kind of happen. person pulled up this morning in the first service when we got here, and shortly after we got here, and I saw her putting one of those sunshade things, those cardboard things you put up in your window to keep the sun from, you know, making the car so hot. When she came into the building, I reminded her that, you, you remember, you really do need to take that down before you start driving, you know. <laughs> Trust me, look, if you have one of those things, look on it. It will tell you that. It will say something very similar to that. Now, why does that have it there? Because somebody did that, Right? The favorite, I, I saw a whole bunch of these as I was preparing for the message, and I, I, I'm just going to give you one more of the silly kind. 
If you know these uh, Dremel tools, that's a, that's a brand name, but these little rotary things that have, you know, cutting devices and drills and things, usually, you know, they're small little things. You usually use them for hobbies. Apparently, some company was felt the need to put on there that that drill was not to be used as a dental instrument. But here's the thing. I want us to think about warning labels as being helpful. And I want us to maybe take a little bit of a stretch today and realize that the Scripture has warning labels in them time and time again. And we don't recognize them as such because the warning labels that I just talked about on the products that we use are written in a negative sense. They tell you, do not use this electrical device while taking a shower. The Scripture will typically tell, give you a warning and give that warning in a, in a positive sense. And it's a sense of what you need to do and know to avoid that. Because there's unforeseen danger out there. I chose... Ephesians today. I could have chosen a whole array of, of scriptures that, that talk about warning us about dangers that we probably haven't even thought about. You see, the Apostle Paul, by the time he wrote Ephesians, knew all about unforeseen dangers. He had seen them. He, he had been broadsided. He had been incarcerated and beaten. And, and, and without, I mean, you don't go into to a town and place and and um, expect that to happen, not even Paul. By the time Ephesians were written, Paul had already written Galatians and 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, and Romans. And if you read Corinthians and Romans in particular, you know that those were churches that, and, and, and congregations and communities of, of believers who had some serious, serious problems there. And those problems were creating dangers that they were not even aware of. So, so Paul, through the, the movement of the Holy Spirit, says, hey, look, Hey guys, you got to stop doing this. You, you got to start doing what Christ did. You got to start being Christ like. In Ephesians, he talked about behaviors, he calls them virtues. He talks about behaviors that demonstrate integrity and decency and worthiness. When he says, be worthy of the, of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, he's not talking about salvation, he's talking about how you live your life out. And he gives some examples, which is another reason why I chose this particular piece of scripture for today. I want our, I want our brand new church members and our, our newly baptized folks to understand that, that the scripture helps us be the disciple of Christ that we, we've just publicly said we were going to be. First thing, first thing Paul talks about here is he uses the word humility. You're going to be, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you've got to be humble. And that doesn't mean you have low self-esteem or don't have a good self-image of yourself. It means that you know that your place in the order for all your gifts and talents and graces that God has given you, you know that you are not Jesus Christ and you're certainly not God the, the creator. He talks, uses a word that really it's hard to understand today, gentleness and meekness. Aristotle talks about meekness and, and gentleness as being that, that middle between always being overtly angry and on one end of the scale and on the other end of the scale not ever having anything get your ire up. There's, I'll go with the flow, everything's fine person who is angry at the right times for the right reason is never angry at the wrong time is it, that person is completely under the control of God and that is what gentleness and meekness means he talks about patience which is sometimes called long suffering and describes that spirit which will never give in and because it never gives in it endures to the end and it will ultimately reap a reward it's a spirit which has a power to take revenge, but never does so. It, it refuses to retaliate. It bears every insult and injury without bitterness and without complaint. 
William Barclay, you may or may not be familiar, if, if you've been around me for a while in some of my Sunday school lessons or whatever, you know that I love the Barclay commentaries. William Barclay is a Scottish Presbyterian and um, just says it like it is. When he's talking about patience and long-suffering, he says, It is a spirit which can suffer unpleasant people with graciousness and fools without irritation. I don't know about you, but i got to work on that. By the way, the Greek word that gets translated patience and long-suffering, the definition we just talked about, that, that is used time and time and time and time again to describe God in the New Testament. One who never gives up, never gives in. Paul talks more, and he's, at this point he shifts from what these qualities is that, that bring us to be followers of Jesus Christ. So talking about what that result, what that means in the long haul. And what that means in the long haul is that we'll, we'll have a sense of unity. There's one body, one Christ, one baptism, one, one new birth. There's ever time when we needed to hear what it takes to be united. I think it's now. If there's ever a time when we needed to really understand what it is that brings unity inside a congregation, inside a denomination, inside our world, it's, it's now. You see, we know how in disarray our world is right now, but... The world in the first century really wasn't too much different. Paul says that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And he says that for a reason. He's already wrote, has written those, those letters and the, that writing to, to the people in Corinth and who were fussing and fighting and getting mad with each other over really important things and, and things that didn't matter at all. He wrote a letter to the church in Galatia that, was, that had received him warmly and was, 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 uh, was doing well. And then people came in and started poisoning their mind with things that really weren't true. This is a congr- I, w- I don't want to say the word church because at this point in history, the, it, it, the believers, the church as we know it didn't exist. There were folks who were gathered in different communities who were we're trying to learn about Jesus Christ and what it means to be a disciple. And some were getting it better than others, and some were doing just fine, and then, they, then folks started coming in. But it was, it was in a disarray. Paul comes in and says, you don't have to be a Jew to follow the Jewish traditions to be a follower of Jesus Christ. The people who are Jewish people, Peter being one of them, said, oh, yes, you do. And then the battle's on. There were folks that had, that had trouble understanding what, what worship was about and were always literally pushing folks away and getting into arguments and getting drunk before, before our, you know, worship time and, and didn't see any problem with that. And so there were people that were, just didn't understand what Jesus' message was about because Jesus talked about grace and forgiveness so it means I can do anything I want through the week. Why? Because I can go and ask for forgiveness and start over again, right? It was a mess. Congregations were filled with people who were Jewish and thought everybody should be Jewish. Gentiles who didn't, who felt they were being discriminated against and then neglected, and in some cases they were. There were people who were of wealth and high standing. There were there were folks who were were tax collectors, traders, basically by most people, prostitutes, people of just a very low income and, and a lifestyle to show that, and and everything in between. And Paul's talking here about somehow or other bringing all that into a sense of unity. And that's why he says what he says. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I listen to television preachers a fair amount. And I'm so amazed at how many of them talk about we need to be united and, and all that. But, it, but it, it's very clear after a while that it's united as long as we're all thinking and believing what I'm talking about. Paul says, wait a minute, the, the way to get by that, not the way to get around, the way to, to, to deal with that is that we are all one in Jesus Christ. But here's the kicker. Did you notice what Paul said at verse 7 today? We stopped at verse 7, I think. 
very last thing he says there is that we've all been given grace according to the, to the uh, being given grace according to God's spirit. What he's saying there is this. We are all different. We all have different talents, abilities. We can do different things. We have, we, some things are easy and, and, and we can do them. Some things are difficult and, and God uses all of that. God has given all of that to us. If any of you out there have more than one child, two or more, you at some point have said to yourself, just thought to yourself, I'm absolutely amazed that I have two kids. In my case, I have three. Three boys, in my case, who are so not like one another. Different talents, different personalities, different gifts. Some are good at this, some are good at that, and they all have certain things in common. But sometimes I wonder, how could all three of those guys be mine? Trust me, they are. But I, I, you know, I, I, I wonder that sometime. Because unity is not uniformity. I'll say that again. I want you to really hear that. Unity is not uniformity. When people, I hear people talk about, well, we need to be united in things, and then all of a sudden we start getting into arguments over what kind of, or disagreements over what kind of baptism is, is the correct one, or what kind of organization, or what kind of, you know, structure. And, uh, Paul says, unity comes from being devoted to Jesus Christ, first and foremost. Everything else will come in place. Galatians 5.15 says, if you, However, if you keep biting one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So there is unity. It is possible. It's God-given. It's empowered by Jesus' teaching. It's empowered by the Holy Spirit. But every now and then we need to be reminded how this is done. That this how is not exclusively our effort. About 1,700 years after Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, there was an Anglican priest in England who was quite concerned about just the lack of moral decisions and the lack of structure within the Anglican church and how there didn't seem to be any way for, the, for spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. It just it was a dismal time. And that guy's name was John Wesley, and after he realized what this was and he started thinking about it, he came up with what he called the general rules. And I'm sure those of you who just we just brought into the church, you were taught that during confirmation. There's three of them, and I want to just talk briefly about the first one. The first one is do no harm. The second one is do all the good you can. The third one is stay in love with God. That's a modern version of it. What Wesley said was, was attend to the ordinances of God, if you know what that means. But think about this a second. How, does, how do we engage in unity? We do no harm. We make a decision. We ask God to give us that ability to do no harm. Isn't that the first rule we teach our children? Isn't it really? Early, early on, you'll teach your child, you do not bite. You do not throw your toys. I left some coins out the other day at the house, and Grayson, our little two-year-old grandson, was there. Next thing I know, he picks up the coins, and he goes over to the register, that little metal great thing at the floor, sticks them in the slot. <laughs> I don't know whether the, he thought that was a piggy bank or whether his mom and dad had been taking him to the boats. I don't know, but he, you know, he, he, I have a lot of money down in the furnace somewhere, apparently. <laughs> Do no harm. That's the first thing we teach our children. And without this restraint, we would damage any opportunity for unity. That's a simple rule. It's not an easy rule, but it's a simple rule. We've been talking about warning labels. And we've been talking about what Paul, through the Holy Spirit, said about, about them. We've talked about John Wesley. And we could have talked about so many others. So many other great men and women of the faith who have have taught us how to stay away from impending danger, who have warned us about the, the, the path that we were taking and how we need to, to, be, to, to correct ourselves and, and get back on that path. The whole point of the book of Ephesians is that Jesus has brought unity to a disunified, ununified world. 
We need to learn that. I think we need to couple that with this idea that to our the best we can, and we fail about this miserably often. But we try so hard to bring this presence of Jesus Christ, this unity in the world without doing harm to someone else. God sent servants to warn us about these unforeseen dangers or the foreseeable dangers. But it's faith in Jesus Christ that allows us to work toward that unity. It's the purpose of a community of faith, a congregation to proclaim that unity. Various folks have shared their thoughts about what it is to be to work toward the unity of, of Christ. I want to add one more voice as I conclude this morning. I found this on uh, one of my social media pages. I'm not sure which one. You've probably seen it. Some of you have at least. It's by Alore DeShane. And as I read this, every time I read this, I think about what it means to be to find unity in a world that has very little of it. And every time I read this, I think about this idea of, of doing no harm as being the very first th- step, first rule, if you will, to, to approach unity. She says this, Be the person who breaks the cycle. If you were judged, choose understanding. If you were rejected, choose acceptance. If you were shamed, choose compassion. Be the person you needed when you were hurting, not the person who hurt you. Vow to be better than who broke you. To heal instead of becoming bitter so you can act from the heart and not from your pain. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.